So today's presentation is basically the explanation of previous presentation that was just a slide presentation with many different beetles. And uh, the idea is that on this channel, uh, I make kind of dual presentation, one without comments, uh, just uh, slides and music so that people can openly uh, just observe the nature and then uh, I would also provide comments in separate videos. So this one video is uh, about the presentation uh, Splendor of Beatles. And um, here I would like to uh, tell you a little bit more uh, about different specimens <clears throat> that I featured in that presentation. So uh, since this is uh, the first uh, presentation which gives a little bit more educational background on the on the world of insects uh, just to mention that beetles uh, are uh, the, the most numerous uh, group of insects or order of insects and uh, there is over 400,000 described species which is roughly about one quarter of all living things so if you go outside in nature uh, for a walk, uh, there is one quarter chance that you will see a beetle um, uh, among any other things. Of course, plants are the most numerous, but uh, uh, among animals, beetles uh, will be the most numerous uh, creatures that you will, uh, you will see in nature. So how to recognize beetles uh, if, you, if you're not a biologist? Uh, beetles have hard wings, so they look like little tanks. Uh, all insects have six legs or, or three pairs of legs, uh, but beetles have hard wings, uh, uh, which most species can elevate and then uh, lift up. And then be, uh, beneath these hard wings, uh, their uh, wings beetles use for flight. And uh, these uh, second pair of wings uh, actually can be folded. So you cannot see their full length. They're actually completely concealed uh, beneath the hard wings. But once hard wings are opened, uh, these uh, wings for flight, they, they can be actually assembled the way um, they have a little joint and they, they can stretch and then beetles fly. So they're not... Uh, very elegant in flight, but still, can you imagine uh, if we were able to make uh, something like a tank uh, that can fly? And uh, quite interesting. Uh, so beetles, uh, as all other insects, have two options uh, in terms of their coloration. And many specimens that you've seen in the presentation of Splendor of Beetles uh, do have structural colors. Those are metallic colors, but also there are colors based on pigments. So generally speaking about nature, these are two main ways how living things can be colored. Structural colors are not based on pigment. So there, there are no molecules that are pigmented, like when you use paint or something and you do your art, those are pigment. Uh, pigment-based paints uh, and pigment itself has colors uh, while in structural colors basically the the way how uh, skeleton and uh, exoskeleton uh, which beetles have so basically skeleton in beetles is outside what you see is beetle skeleton so that exoskeleton uh, can be very complex in its structure and can actually make different effects, light effects based on sunlight uh, uh, to which the surface of beetle is exposed. So uh, different physical phenomena like diffraction, interference, and some other uh, can actually produce the effect of color. You can see color and those are usually metallic colors, although there is no actual pigment. And that is quite amazing. Um, some butterflies, for example, also can have structural colors. For example, blue morpho, famous morpho butterflies, 
once we'll probably talk about them but in butterflies their wings are very flat and we can consider their surface body surface as two-dimensional and for uh, different structural colors uh, to be expressed, two dimensions have less options than three dimensions. So three dimensional body of beetle uh, makes uh, some sort of, of network or net uh, that can produce way more effects than, for example, butterflies. And because of that, many beetles look jam like and uh, because of that, uh, me as a person who studies pattern, actually I favor beetles compared to butterflies, although I also study butterflies and moths, and we'll have some presentations on butterflies and moths, but I favor beetles because their capability to express structural colors is way more advanced than what, what we can find in butterflies. So, uh, I already mentioned that exoskeleton. So keep in mind that basically all specimens that you will see in my presentations are dead specimens, dry specimens. And for people who love nature, and I am among those people, uh, if you're not within the field, it might sound harsh uh, to you. Why do we kill these insects? And uh, of course, there, there is no 100% excuse for that. But keep in mind that our capability to study nature uh, scientifically uh, relays on, on our capability to observe things. And although many people observe uh, alive uh, organisms, to study structure and patterns, uh, we have to have specimens. Now, uh, I am against uh, just destroying uh, nature relentlessly, but when we collect insects, unfortunately, we have to uh, we have to kill them if we would like to keep them in the collection. Uh, keep in mind that not a single species was destroyed or, or uh, driven to extinction because of collecting. So people who collect insects, entomologists, bug collectors, enthusiasts, they actually love nature. And uh, I am one of people who collect insects. Uh, the, the sample that we take from nature is very small. So there's never so many collectors when we talk about insects. I mean, it's a completely different situation when we talk about mammals or, or something like that. But when we talk about insects, there's so many of them, they're so small and so well hidden in their environment that uh, no matter how hard we try, we always can spot only a small sample of those, uh, sufficient that we can make census on the, the, the presence of species in ecosystems. We can discover new species, but we never can exhaust natural environment to the point that some species get get extinct. As a matter of fact, uh, bug collecting actually helps general public uh, to be more aware of the need of preservation of nature. And one of my goals in these presentations, when, when I show you uh, the beauty of nature, is to actually know more about the nature. And in that way, uh, we can increase increasingly uh, be aware that uh, there is need to preserve and protect nature. The species uh, that you've seen for, for many people, just for laymen, uh, you, you have never seen these things. Uh, so there are different reasons for, for that. As a bug philosopher, maybe I once dedicated just the topic why general public does not see so many species. Uh, can you imagine 400,000 species? What you've seen in this presentation is just small sample. Of course, I, I decided to show the species uh, that are, for me, the most beautiful. 
but the question of aesthetics is something that we'll also uh, uh, explore in these presentations a lot. So maybe something that is beautiful for me is not beautiful for somebody else. However, this would be my, my selection of most beautiful beetles uh, in the world. So there's so many species that we can, can't actually uh, show them all, neither I have them all in my collection, but even such small sample can help the uh, general public to understand that complexity and beauty of nature uh, is way beyond of what we usually think and that we have obligation for, for our generation and for next generations to protect nature because there's so many still undiscovered species and there's so tiny and, and uh, so fragile relations between the species and ecosystems that we actually do not know uh, what and how functions in the nature yet. So we are in the process of learning. And because of that, we have that obligation to preserve nature. So uh, making collections of insects is one way for us to study uh, nature. Uh, another excuse, if you like, to collect insects is that they have very short lifespan. So uh, the development of insects is very complex. Beetles or coleopterans, they have a complete metamorphosis. What that means? Well, their larval stage or young stage looks completely different than adults. What you've seen in the presentation are adults, uh, but larval stages are worm-like and they, uh, they go through the metamorphosis in the stage of pupa and then from pupa, uh, adult insects emerge. In many cases, we don't even know how larval and pupal stage look. And that is another interesting topic. So for most species, we know adult stages because they're, <laughs> they move more, they, they can fly. Larval stages cannot fly, so they're actually difficult to spot in nature. So that short lifespan uh, that insects have uh, for beetles is usually a couple of weeks when they're adults. Uh, their main goal is just to reproduce uh, and continue their species when they're all uh, adults. Most species, uh, uh, the, the biggest part of their life is as larval stage. So basically we collect insects usually in the last stages of their life and uh, they would perish anyways. Uh, most of them uh, achieve the goal of reproduction before we collect them. Uh, so there's no really uh, serious impact on the nature uh, when we collect insects. In terms of uh, killing specimens for the, for the collection, uh, we scientists are trying uh, to be uh, very careful about that, not to expose specimens to suffering. So there, there are different ways uh, how specimens are euthanized before, uh, before uh, we can spread them in the collection and prepare them for the collection. Uh, now, uh, the, the exoskeleton that, that we mentioned uh, means skeleton is outside. And what you see basically in the collection are the mummies of, uh, of beetles and insects in general. And uh, it's quite astonishing that skeleton can be, uh, can look so fresh for many, many years uh, if you keep them in dry conditions uh, uh, away from sunlight. So we can preserve them in special drawers for insect collections for centuries. Uh, quite interestingly, uh, these exoskeletons that protect uh, insects also have many other functions that they can recognize their species based on their colors. Uh, sometimes males and females have different coloration. We call that sexual dimorphism. And there's so, so many different things uh, to mention about, uh, about beetles and about other insects. So that would be generally just uh, some introduction about beetles and uh, beetles to know a little bit about their biology. 
Uh, in the comments of the presentation, many people ask for, for the names of species. And of course, it, it's good to know names. But the thing is, most species of insects do not have common names. So to provide the names, uh, the best is maybe just to know the level of families of, of beetles. So there are many different families of beetles taxonomically. And in this presentation, uh, most of beetles uh, belong to the family of longhorns. So those are uh, beetles with long antennae. And uh, longhorns are also the, the very numerous family, uh, family of uh, beetles. But the most numerous family are vivils. So those are uh, relatively small beetles with little trunk. Uh, so their mouth is at the end, jaws are at the end of that trunk, and weevils usually feed as adults, they usually feed on some seeds, uh, sometimes leaves, but mostly seeds, and because of that they have that little nostril trunk uh, that they can reach inside the seeds. Uh, so weevils that I uh, represented are bas basically short-nosed in this presentation, but in some other presentations you will see some weevils with that longer trunk. Weevils are the most numerous family of beetles, so there's over 40,000 known species just in the family of weevils. And that is pretty much the, the equivalent to all vertebrates, so all animals with the backbone from fish to, to mammals uh, have the number of species, which is maybe even less than weevils because many species still wait to be described and discovered uh, in terms of weevils. While for, for vertebrates, most species are already discovered. So that single family of beetles is more numerous than actually all backbone animals that actually we call usually animals. Uh, insects are invertebrates and sometimes people do not them, do not consider them as animals. So when you say animal, people usually think mammals, birds, maybe reptiles. Uh, but all these are animals, so everything that is not fungi or, or plant is an animal. Uh, and uh, so beside weevils and longhorn beetles, uh, there's several more families that I feature in the pre presentation, uh, the splendor of, of beetles. Uh, at the end of presentation, there is one interesting family, erotilids, uh, that are actually fungus uh, beetles. And uh, when you see very colorful beetle or very, very co colorful insect in general, uh, doesn't really matter if it's pigment based on stru or structural color, but most, or actually more specifically, more, more cases of pigment based colors. If you see colorful species, most of them are poisonous. And most of these species uh, uh, featured in the presentation are from tropics. So tropical species tend to be uh, more colorful than, uh, than species that usually live in, in North America or Europe. And the reason for that is that there are more resources. So to produce all these pigments, uh, insects need a very complex biochemistry that requires lots of energy. And of course, there's more, there's more food, there, there are more resources in tropics. Uh, also, there's no winter and change of seasons so or, uh, insects and other organisms have actually more time to achieve different goals in their development and because of that most tropical species are so colorful so uh, that exoskeleton uh, contains either pigments or uh, plays with the with the sunlight producing the colors uh, that are metallic one group of beetles that you've seen in the presentation are scarab beetles. And uh, one, particular, uh, one particular subfamily in which genus uh, Plusiotis or Hrisina uh, was uh, featured. And those are the beetles that look completely metallic. 
from time to time, um, I used to make uh, exhibitions of these, these specimens. And then when school would visit or, 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 or uh, some group of kids, a uh, usual reaction would be they would ask me, is that car paint uh, on the surface of these beetles? And of course, all, all the colors and everything that you see in my presentations are completely natural. So they're not altered in any, any possible way. So uh, some of these uh, Hyrcina beetles are so reflective that they actually look uh, like little mirrors uh, and many species uh, look silver-like or gold-like. And the question is why they're so, uh, you know, so uh, interestingly uh, painted naturally, if you like. Uh, and the answer is when you take them from their natural environment, yeah, it's easy to spot them and it's not logical that, that you know, they're so, so attractive. Uh, they can attract predators, right? But uh, when they're in their natural environment and there are boreal species, they live high in the trees, chewing on leaves uh, in the Central America and South America in, in the tropics. Such a reflective exoskeleton that looks like mirror uh, actually mirrors the environment, mirrors the leaves around, and they're very difficult to spot. So it's almost like active, uh, uh, active projection of of the environment on their surface uh, that's military is trying to, to explore for some vehicles uh, these days but in nature we can find some high technology that we're just reaching these days or even it's beyond our capability so that is one interesting group uh, and then uh, i featured several species also scarab beetles but different subfamily uh, which uh, that, that's more toward the end of presentation that have horns uh, but not horns like antennae horn on on their head and these uh, beetles look very robust so that is because uh, they're cleaners in the nature so these scarab beetles their larvae uh, develop in the in the feces of some animals so they roll feces of animals in the little bowls and then dig the holes uh, in the ground, put these balls inside the ground and then lay eggs so that their larval stage feeds on, on that material. But what is interesting naturally, so they're cleaners of nature and uh, they also fertilize soil naturally. So that's huge army, natural army of little robots. And I consider very often beetles like little robots, natural robots. And, and this particular group of scarab beetles, uh, they actually clean the nature, but also fertilize nature in one very, uh, very efficient way. So maybe it's not, not the cleanest job in, in the nature, but they, they do very, uh, very important jobs. Some other species uh, can be pollinators and can, can have uh, many different uh, different roles in the nature and in ecosystems. So there are so many things to mention about beetles. This would be just the shortest possible uh, explanation of that presentation. So if you like what I do on this channel, please subscribe. Uh, please invite more of your friends and family to, to actually learn about the beauty of nature and about many different aspects of insects that surround us, but very often we do not have time to focus and to actually notice what they're doing, but they, they do a very important job. So please subscribe. And also, if you like, uh, you can support uh, my work on Patreon. Uh, the link is in the description. So if, you're, if you scroll down in the description of presentation, you can see link for my uh, Patreon page. Uh, also, please, uh, please follow some other presentations uh, that I'm going to offer on this channel. Thank you very much for your attention.